Spofford Reading Daily. We are continuing to read Hinterland, America's New Landscape of Class and Conflict by Phil A. Neal. We are still on Chapter 1. I want to please ask anybody that's taking a listen to this to share this on some social media platform, whichever one it may be. I want to remind people that we put these episodes out on Spotify, Pocket Cast, Anchor, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, SoundCloud, Facebook. So anywhere you can find audio, we have audio available for this podcast series. If you haven't before, please listen to previous episodes of Rafa Reading Daily. Uh, and if by the time you get a hold of this, there's new episodes out, I would encourage you to please listen to those as well. Okay, so previously on Rafa Reading Daily, I'm going to start trying to do these previously as well. We read about the Oath Keepers group, the Patriots group, the Three Percenters group, all of these different alt-right white nationalist groups that exist within the country. And we learned about some of their ideologies, some of their tactics, and some of the ways that they have preyed upon the this new landscape of class and conflict. So we're still in chapter one. We're moving on to the next section, which is entitled Deserts. In Nevada, I could feel the long crisis with the terrifying intimacy, as if it was some sort of uncanny bodily contact, like the feeling you get camped out in the swirling galaxy littered darkness of the open range when a reptile brushes up against your prostrate body. Except that the reptile at least shares with you some deep serpentine connection, a lineage lost somewhere in the plummet of primeval, primeval time. Primeval time? The crisis, on the other hand, is a vast creature, not contained by familiar scales of time or space. It is a social terror made of masses of machines and animals, yet not in any way kin to these components. And what we sense of it today is merely one of its many limbs extending backward from its true body writhing somewhere just out of sight, at home in our own incomprehensible future. And when Winnemucca, the hotels were all sold out indefinitely because a natural gas pipeline was being built somewhere out there in the trackless waste. This one small capillary opened by the crisis flooding the worth opened by the crisis flooding the worthless dust with gold. Workers swarmed into every available space, drawn from all the poorest parts of the country, as well as the poorest parts of neighboring ones. Some of the old timers in the bar talked about this boom in the shape of booms long past seamlessly mixing casual racism with moral derision for those slightly lower on the rungs of white trash than they. Those workers come in for two weeks, they say in quiet, even tones, the brims of their sun-cooked hats cutting into the smoke, and after two weeks, they're buying tricked-out new trucks on credit, hauling those big families in. Yet everything remains somehow just out of sight. I never saw the pipeline, though the workers flooded through the hotels and restaurants and casinos around me. Every morning, buses filled with people departed from a lot near our trailer park, some heading to the pipeline, but most carrying workers out to distant mines. Shipments of gold and silver were trucked out of these mines periodically, surrounded by heavily armed paramilitary convoys. But the mines remained tucked far out of sight behind mountain ranges and layers of perimeter fencing. Meanwhile, my co-worker and I would drive out every morning far into the desert where we removed fencing put up by an identical crew almost a decade ago. We could see distant ranches, mostly growing alfalfa with water drawn up from hidden aquifers, but we rarely saw another person. Every couple weeks, our bank accounts were filled electronically by the Department of the Interior out of stimulus money allotted to the BLM during the bailouts. Everything seemed animated by an invisible force, all choreographed in some indecipherable ritual that simply was not meant for us. The sparse character of the desert seemed to draw the crisis so much closer because it stripped away everything but this ritual, making people's orbits around the invisible gravity of capital discernible against the desert's flat plain. There was a sign just off the interstate near a small trailer town called Golconda that had two arrows, one pointing north and one south. The first arrow said, quote, mines, the other, end quote, the other, quote, ranches, end quote. 
We drove somewhere between the two to get out into the mountains. Our orbits only small, errant arcs cast between occupations of greater gravity. The crisis is maybe most visible in the desert because the crisis makes deserts. And it is these deserts that make them malicious, or at least that make them an actual threat. The grim potential of these new patriot parties arises via their ability to organize in the vacuum left by the collapse of local economies. It's easy for city dwellers to dismiss the militias as simple far-right fanboys playing soldier in the Arizona desert, but that's because the real deserts are largely invisible from the metropolis. They are simply too far beyond its walls. The progressive narrative, embodied in an entire subgenre of think piece that we might simply call tax collector journalism, therefore it tends to treat their issues as if nearby ruralities just, quote, oppose taxes, end quote, and therefore bring such funding shortfalls upon themselves. A slightly more sinister variant argues that by backing candidates that reject increases in property tax, small, often out-of-county patriot groups actually construct the crises facing these rural areas. But these positions are nonsensical when we consider the fact that the collapse of revenues drawn from the land via extricative industries also means a declining property value for these lands and therefore a diminishing base of property taxes to draw from, all accompanying the disappearance of any commodity tax from timber sales, for example. The claim that this crisis was somehow, quote, created, end quote, by anti-tax conservative ruralities or by small, relatively recently developed anti-government groups simply ignores that the basis of tax revenue is in industrial production, whether taxed at the level of capital, commodity sale, land ownership, or wage income. Less industrial output means either fewer taxes or a higher share of tax to income for most residents. Increased property taxes likely cannot be afforded by small landholders for whom employment is sparse, and therefore, the progressive's alternative of increasing property taxes is simply a program of dispossession for small landholders. It is no wonder, then, that these small holders align themselves with ranchers, miners, and even larger corporate landowners, all of whom will be paying the largest lump sum in taxes to oppose such measures. It is here that the class basis of the far right begins to become visible. With the new members joining the Patriot movement drawn from a generation less convinced by the old militias' narratives of racial supremacy, the ideological focus of such groups has instead turned largely to issues of land politics. Visions of race war have been replaced by a, nonetheless racially coded, prophecy of oncoming civil war that pits diverse, liberal urban areas against the hinterland. It is easy to seize upon the more conspiratorial aspects of these fears, such as the claim that the U.N. is set to invade the U.S. with the help and preparation of the federal government in order to dismiss these movements wholesale. But going but doing so tends to obscure the fact that these groups are responding, however incoherently, to their experience of the long crisis and the new geography being created by it. The results are inevitably grim and occasionally made wide. Excuse me. The results are inevitably grim and occasionally made visible in sweeping acts of political devastation, the urban liberal weeping at the shore of a blood-red ocean stretched between California and New York, and expands somehow invisible until November 8, 2016, the 18th brumoire of Donald Trump. In reality, the far right's political base is not defined by sheer xenophobia and idiocy, and their political analysis though sprinkled with occult themes and mystical logic, is not entirely hollow. To take a common example, the idea of George Soros secretly funding the most violent aspects of things like Occupy Wall Street and Black Lives Matter is a common trope, and it is only the more extreme version of a widespread perception that urban elites use forms of government patronage, in particular welfare and affirmative action, to buy the loyalty of minority groups and thereby turn them against, quote, working people, end quote, who have no access to such patronage. Progressive critics often point out the ways in which this theory and many affiliate conspiracies mimic the anti-Semitic narratives of the old militia movement, drawn from the historic far right. 
But what this critique misses is the simple fact that these conspiracies approximately, if incorrectly, describe structures of power so pervasive as to be mundane to most people. The Democratic Party does, obviously and publicly, fund, quote, radical, end quote, projects as a method of co-optation rather than radicalization, as the right would have it. And this constant cultivation of a strong, radical in garb, but centrist at heart base among labor unions, NGOs, local governments, and any number of, quote, community, end quote, organizations claiming to represent particular minority groups or simply, quote, people of color, end quote, as a whole. This patronage is not evenly allotted to the urban poor, however, and it largely does not come in the form of, quote, welfare, end quote, as the far right argues, but instead is grants, campaign funding, charitable donations, and services provided by churches, NGOs, or local governments, much of which is allotted to the upper middle class segments of disadvantaged populations rather than those most in need. This method of co-optation and recruitment is therefore part of a real alliance built between the liberal upper segments of dispossessed urban populations and the particular fraction of elites who fund the Democratic Party. This is the Democratic Party machine. There is nothing conspiratorial about it. So we're getting a, a more in-depth layout of what some of the conflicts, some of the political conflicts are like in these hinterland areas and some of the things that they're struggling over and struggling for. Uh, and at the same time, we're also seeing, getting a deeper look into the ideology of these groups. And one of the things that stood out to me was that last passage that we read about the Democratic Party and some of the tactics that the Democratic Party takes and how these far right groups are able to manipulate those tactics to galvanize uh, white people and, and conservative people to be uh, more aligned with them and to be more opposed to not only just the Democratic Party, but also the people who the Democratic Party is claiming to help, you know, poor people, uh, unemployed people, black people, people of color. And what I thought was very poignant that Phil A. Neal pointed out in the passage that we read is that in truth, the, the Democratic Party isn't even doing anything to help the people who are the most dispossessed from these communities. They're helping people who are maybe more, they said middle class here, but I think one of the other terms that I would use is people who are uh, closer to the mainstream of the American society and not the ones that are further out on the fringes of American society. And then also, I believe one of the things that the Democratic Party does a lot, too, is they do these the they do PR politics, public relation politics, where when something seems to be trending as a social issue, the Democratic Party will throw some money to one of the big organizations that's connected to that social issue or they'll, you know, have their whoever the, their their biggest spokespeople are have little talking points about these issues when these issues become uh, more closer to the forefront of the social consciousness. And so I think that it was that that last paragraph was very important because it is very true that a lot of times the Democratic Party puts themselves publicly in a position to seem as if they are uh, doing some type of uh, radical changes or they are, you know, they want some type of radical progression to be happening uh, in the country. And in reality, they're trying to co-opt these people who are trying to have radical changes and radical development and radical progression happen in the country. And because they believe that they already have black people and, and people of color and minorities in their back park in their back pocket as, as voters, they don't do anything that's, they don't do many things that are very genuine about changing what uh, the core value system of this country is, but they do do things that to somebody to the untrained eye may seem like that. And so what ends up happening to me, in, in my opinion, is that they don't, the Democratic Party don't help the people that they are trying to uh 
publicize that they're helping. They're not really helping them, but they're trying to spend money to publicize that they're doing it in the hopes to maintain the black votes and the people of color votes and the poor working class votes that they have. And then the conservative and Republican Party or these far right alt right groups uh, use their their sort of uh, public relations to make it seem like they're helping these people as a way to not only demonize the Democratic Party, but also demonize the people that they're claiming to be helping. And they use that to galvanize more people over to their side and to to keep their base strong. And the only people who really end up getting hurt in this are the uh, poor people of color, working class people of color who are not being helped. And then the poor white people, working class white people who are being brainwashed and who are being uh, who are subconsciously being taught to uh, be opposed to people who have very similar interests to them. Uh, and I think that that's one of the things that books like this do a very good job of doing is it, it points out the similarities that people have across the race lines. As we're reading through this, we're hearing about people who are not uh, particularly wealthy or particularly rich, people who are struggling and, and trying to make ends meet, people who uh, who the areas that they that they live in ha- are being divested from and are not being and are being exploited in ways. Uh, But again, so many times we can't fix some of these things because of the issue of race, uh, the issue of gender uh, or issues of sexuality, which exist in this country, which are things that are. Which are things that are as long as they are being used to uh, have people adversarial against each other, they are very real, tangible things. Uh, But the moment that we can stop allowing those things to be used to uh, make people adversarial against each other, you can begin to tear down those social constructs. Okay, let's continue reading. The Carhartt Dynasty. The Republican Party operates on a roughly symmetrical base built up among rural white sub-elites and a whole array of urban or peri-urban petty capitalist interests. Most of the Patriot groups essentially acknowledge this in their rejection of both parties, but groups like the Oath Keepers and the Three Percenters recognize openings in the base of the Republican Party that do not exist for them in the base of the Democratic Party, due to the Republicans' extent into the very areas of rural devastation that Democrats tend to ignore. Their attempt at tactical infiltration of this base in order to widen their power vacuum in which they operate is then seen by urban progressives as more evidence that conservative Republicans are somehow secretly behind the economic devastation experienced in these areas. And if poor ruralities only had better information, they would vote for Democrats who would raise taxes and thereby fix the funding shortfall. But, again, it all returns to the issue of shrinking industrial output leading to a shrinking tax base. It is not, quote, taxes, end quote, as such that the population opposes here, but the twin dependencies wrought from the economic collapse. On one side, people in rural areas are increasingly dependent on federal funding for employment and wildland firefighting and forest management and local school districts and healthcare systems almost entirely maintained by federal aid and agricultural production sustained by subsidized government purchase programs. And on the other hand, they therefore experience class exploitation as largely a matter of rents rather than wages. This leads to a populist analyst that emphasizes this form of exploitation and its attendant crises all over. I butchered that sentence. Sorry about that. Let's try it again. <clears throat> this leads to a populist analysis that emphasizes this form of exploitation and its attendant crises over all others obscuring the deep interdependencies between what such populists portray as the, quote, real, end quote, economy, and the, quote, false, end quote, economy of finance. It should not be surprising, then, that the far right has seized upon this and put issues of land management and local government authority at the forefront of its political program. The Border Patrol operations staffed by such militias are often treated as mere training grounds for near-term confrontations with the federal government in the American interior and long-term confrontations with opponents in the new civil war to come. 
The bulk of the popularity of the Patriot Movement has come not from such patrols, but instead out of direct confrontations with federal agents, all of which have ostensibly been protests about land use in the rural West. The first of these was the Bundy Ranch standoff in 2014 in Buckerville, Nevada, followed by the slightly smaller Sugar Pine Mine defense in Josephine County in 2015, and finally, the occupation of the Mauler Wildlife Refugee Refuge in 2016 in Burns, Oregon. Despite being concentrated in a handful of states, the activities of this far western wing of the Patriot Movement have had a cohering effect on the far right at the national scale. There have thus far been no correlates. There has thus far been no correlates among the militia movement of Michigan or the KKK in Louisiana, though members of such groups certainly form part of the support base for the Western Patriots. Similarly, the anti-immigrant border patrols in Arizona have been happening for over a decade now, and Though an important component of many far-right groups' training, these patrols have failed to garner the same kind of widespread attention and popularity. This is because the specific land politics of the far western hinterland have offered the new right-wing movement an effective theater in which to oppose rent-taking and thereby form the rudiments of a mass base. The crux of patriot movement land politics is the desire to see federally controlled lands return to local management in order to revive long-dead local timber, mining, and ranching industries. At the same time, they argue that the devolution of federal power to states and counties will allow local communities to manage their own affairs. The harder edges of the movement, the quote, constitutional sheriffs, end quote, even argue that county sheriffs have a constitutionally mandated right to selectively apply laws passed at higher levels of government, and therefore sheriffs can act as a protective shield against state gun control laws, government surveillance, and the sort of federal mandatory minimum charges applied to people like the Hammonds, whose long-term imprisonment for arson on federal land was the focus of the Mahler occupation. Though somewhat distant from the interest of poor whites in the eastern states, these political foci make perfect sense in the far west, where the bulk of the federal government's more than 630 acres of land is located, mostly in 11 continental states plus Alaska. In Nevada, the federal government owns nearly 85% of the state's land. In Oregon, the number is just over 50%. And in Idaho, the stronghold of the three percenters is around 60%. Much of the immediate conflict inspiring the confrontations that have magnetized the far right has been explicit conflicts over federal rents charged for land use by miners and ranchers. Different states have different levels and structures of management, but the bulk of this land is overseen by either the BLM, 35.9%, or the Forest Service, 32.8%. Though both of these agencies are targeted by patriot groups, the BLM's role in overseeing grazing and mining rights has been the root of all three major occupations in the West thus far. Though often blown out of proportion and incorporated into ideological claims that privatization as such is superior to any sort of government ownership, it's hard to argue with the fact that these federal agencies are often corrupt and certainly fall short of their original mandates. Okay, I had to look up the definition of, or the with the acronym BLM for this book meant again uh, it's Bureau of Land Management for anybody who's like me and <clears throat> that has slipped their mind Bureau of Land Management okay while working for the Bureau of Land Management the head of our office used to brag that the agency brought in five dollars for every four tax dollars put into it while the Forest Service brought in four for every five similarly Stories of the Bureau land management corruption were rife even within the agency, with people whispering at marked down land sales on the edge of Vegas during the housing bubble. Much of what the Bureau of Land Management does, in fact, is apply a vast and bureaucratic system of rents to those using the lands under its domain. This takes the form of fees charged for the recognition of mining claims, the cause of the sugar pine conflict, as well as grazing fees for cattle ranches the direct cause of the Bundy Ranch standoff and the indirect cause of the Mahler occupation. As the direct interface between ruralities and the federal government, 
the Bureau of Land Management is a natural focus for the anti-rent, local control politics of the Patriot Movement. But it also creates a real tension in these rural areas between those who subsist directly or indirectly off these rents and those who pay them, even while they may themselves benefit from similar purchase in subsidies or government price setting programs and the price of agricultural goods. Much of the genuine opposition to the Mahler occupation, for example, came from the Burns area itself. According to data from the American Community Survey for the city of Burns, which does not include the surrounding county or the neighboring Burns Pot Reservation, government workers compose more than a third of the population, 37.3%, and workers in agriculture, forestry, fishing, hunting, and mining are only half of this, 17%. Meanwhile, Local services, such as retail, make up only a little less, 14.6%. But this is, by definition, dependent on the base industries that receive inputs from outside the area economy. That is, the government workers' wages, originating in tax money in excess of that produced in the region, and the in the in-tax money in excess of that... All right. Let's try that again. <clears throat> This book got some long sentences. <laughs> Meanwhile, local services, such as retail makeup, only a little less, 14.6%. But this is by definition dependent on the base industries that receive inputs from outside the area economy. That is, the government workers' wages, originating in tax money in excess of that produced in the region, and the ranchers' income, originating in exports of beef, both go to support the local grocery store. The divergence between the two largest categories is narrowed somewhat at the county level, with government workers at 30.3% of all employees, agriculture at 27.2%, and retail only slightly diminished at 10.5%. The image here is nonetheless one of a bi bifurcated, bifurcated? Hold on, let me see. Bifurcate. Wait. Dang, how, how, it ain't saying it's, it's, it is bifurcate. I don't know why it's not saying. Hold on, let me try one more time. Bifurcate. Yeah, I don't know why it's, it's missing the first pre the prefix, but it's bifurcate, and it means I'm trying to get the word. To, okay, and it means to divide into two branches or forks. <sighs> bifurcate. New word. Okay, the image here is nonetheless one of a bifurcated employment structure with a large chunk of the populace dependent on federal government inputs for their employment and another large chunk dependent on government employees' wages for their jobs in the local economy. It is only natural, then, that something like the Mahler occupation would not necessarily win over a majority of the local populace, who not only do not oppose federal land management, but in fact depend on it for their livelihood. In Burns, the Patriots were ultimately outdone by the state in the game of competitive control since the state itself provided enough stability to the population via its own normative framework, against which the Patriots could offer no real alternative, unlike in the more severely underfunded Josephine County. Many urban critiques of the Patriot movement have focused on these facts to construct, quote, outsider, end quote, narratives of the Patriots, in which these militias enter local, quote, communities, end quote, from elsewhere in order to sow disorder against the wishes of the local population. Organizing against the militias is then portrayed as simply the upholding of the status quo via the silent majority, afraid to speak up when faced with the influx of heavily armed men. But these narratives tend to obscure, or at least ignore in practice, the actual conditions of economic collapse in the countryside and simply reinforce the state's own position relative to rural areas in the far west, which is one of continued contingent dependence and fierce competition for a shrinking pool of government jobs. The work of groups like the Portland-based Rural Organizing Project is a case in point. Urban liberals are paired with locals within the progressive establishment to build grassroots opposition to the militias. But when it actually comes to offering some sort of solution for the widespread economic problems of these areas, the focus is not on building local regimes of dual power to oppose the current economic system, but instead to push for increased taxes and petition. The experience in Burns also hints at the fact that many of those who are most adversely affected by government rents are not necessarily the poorest rural residents or even average ruralities. Such fees, 
combined with property taxes, disproportionately affect landowners and the proprietors of local extractive industries, as well as a wide variety of small businesses struggling to survive amid conditions of widespread economic collapse. The Bundys themselves are a striking image of the class of landholder that forms the figurative and financial backbone of the Patriot movement. Their land value, combined with their yearly income, actually puts them in the upper income brackets of such counties. Similarly, mine owners in Southern Oregon or mill proprietors in Idaho are the literal holders of capital in their respective areas. They are a petty capitalist class that appears, quote, working class, end quote, only through constant, active contrast with well-heeled coastal elites. An important part of this contrast is the fact that they do regularly work their holdings themselves, even while they oversee far less well-off, largely seasonal employees, and are substantially poorer than plenty of urban professionals, not to mention financial elites. Equally important is their constantly maintained, self-aware aesthetic, an amalgamation of traditionally middle American cliches cultivated by large patriarchal families, like the Bundys, variants of which are easily identifiable in most rural areas, the many local dynasties signified by their big trucks, camo hats, and Carhartt jackets, all often just a bit too clean and new. It is this class fraction that is the real heart and focus of the Patriot movement. It is their property that is defended, and they are portrayed as the only forces capable of reviving the local economy. The devolution of federal lands to local control entails effective privatization of these lands into the hands of local holders of cattle and capital, those sleeping gods of the Old West, which the Patriots hope to awaken. All of the other participants in the Patriot movement, many of whom are less well-off veterans and other working-class locals, are nonetheless acting in accordance with the interests of the Carhartt dynasty. There is little evidence that mass support for this politics extends all the way down, and much evidence that simply suggests that rural proletarians, similar to their urban counterparts, have been unable to cohere any substantial political program that has their interest at heart. In such a situation, we again see that support follows strength and belief trails far behind. All right, and that brings us to a changing of the theme within this chapter. The next segment will be entitled Blood Debt. But we will start that on tomorrow's episode. And I think we still got a couple more episodes before we get through this this first chapter. It's a bigger first chapter. It's not that many chapters in this book. Uh, So let's have a small reflection before we end this episode. So my biggest takeaway is just the some of the the differences, some of the drastic differences in what is being combated. Uh, for and against in rural areas as opposed to urban areas, but then also the similarities by who is being fought against or who who people are are having to struggle against or the type of struggles that's going on. The things the uh, on the surface level on on face level, these issues look vastly different. You know, when we talk about some of the urban issues that we've talked about here. Uh, you know, people being unhoused, uh, police terrorism, mass incarceration, uh, uh, inadequate, uh, inadequate living conditions, poor education. You know, these are all things that, of course, are issues as well in in rural spaces. Oh, is that my? That's the batteries. Hold on. Okay, batteries was messing up. But the on the surface level, these things, these issues look vastly different. The, some of the terminology is different. Some of the departments that are involved are different. But once you get past some of those surface level entries and you start to look at what's happening beneath the surface, you see the commonalities. Uh, we talked about, we've read multiple books talking about governmental corruption and how that governmental corruption or governmental negligence leads to everyday people being in marginalized, exploited, exploitative situations. And we re- were reading here in Hinterland how the go- these governmental agencies have are being corrupt, are being uh, negligent, and are doing things that are uh, putting people who live in these rural areas on the margins and, uh, being, and are exploitative towards them. We also have talked about how capitalism and people aspiring to be capitalist or they use the 
they used a term here that I liked, petty capitalist. We've talked about how those those people in those type of industries and businesses, things like that, some of their practices, pro procedures, and policies also work to keep people marginalized and also work to keep people exploited uh, and that you can't have capitalism without having exploitation. And so we see here that, that those same type of cycles are existing in these rural areas as well. And it just reminds me of the importance of, of once you start to, because there are rural areas in Illinois, uh, they're not the same. They don't, of course, they're probably not dealing with the exact same things as what's going on in some of these West Coast areas we're reading about. But still, it's important to be able to uh, expand out ideology and expand out belief patterns and systems and be able to know how to advocate for one thing in a specific, uh, in a specific group or you know be able to advocate for one thing in urban areas and then also be able to when it's time to advocate for something else in rural areas or to be able to uh switch terminology switch understanding switch uh information uh points of information and things like that and so for me that's sort of what this is this is my first time reading hinterland it's my first time uh reading about some of the issues that exist in these rural areas like this and so I'm still trying to get a grasp of all of these things it's my first time hearing about some of these governmental agencies so trying to get a grasp on those things there's also a lot of different vocabulary in this uh so I'm trying to get a grasp on that as well so this has just sort of been like some beginner steps for me in learning about the issues that people in in the rural west face and uh trying to understand the commonalities that exist between those struggles and the struggles that we're waging uh here i think before i end this i also would say that it's been very informative to see some of the tactics that uh what i would say opposing groups or adversarial groups are uh engaging in in order to try to build a base because even though you might not have the exact same ideology or belief as somebody else you can always learn from uh organizational methods and organizational tactics and so that's one of the things that i've also been able to uh learn as we're we've been reading through this as well and so i want to encourage people to please share this on whatever platform you're listening to it on and remember, we put these episodes out on a daily basis to provide people the opportunity to begin or further their journey in the struggle against police, terrorism, mass incarceration and racial injustice. And we'll holler at you tomorrow.